tonight I've chosen a selection to take us on a tour of Britain and Ireland, some of the folklore. Nine poems I've chosen. And I want to begin with this one. I don't know where, which region this one comes from, but it's a piece of folklore I read about of a, of a kind of a spell, a charm to follow if you wish to see the fairy pass by. And it involved lying on a sheepskin, being covered with bullskin, having a cat with you, being at a crossroads with four churches along around you, and holding an axe in your hand and staring, keeping staring at the blade of the axe, no matter what goes past in your peripheral vision. And this was a means to see the fair folk and to maybe gain some knowledge from them. Why the cat is with them, I don't know. Maybe it gives someone for the fairies to talk to. Called listening at the crossroads. Cover me with bullhide on an old grey sheepskin. My grey cat at my side. I shall listen at the crossroads. St Mary's ahead of me, Luke and John to left and right, St Bridget sat behind me, I shall listen at the crossroads. Place my axe in my hand and leave me, making sure none shall see me. In silence be sure to leave me, listening at the crossroads. Cat, will you tell me who lies so beside you? Who's the fellow staring at his axe blade sharp? Nor left nor right he's looking at the line that's passing by him. But he stares at his blade edge bright and fine. Does he want to know his father's gold? is hidden in the cellar floor. Does he want to know his mother's line descended from the queen? Does he want to know his Sally Ann is waiting and is asking? Ha! <laughs> You're a cat and we're the dead. I'll tell him nothing. Going to return to that theme at the end with another poem based on the same piece of folklore. I don't know quite why I give him an Irish accent, if you can call it an Irish accent, but it seems to fit. This next piece regards a bit of folklore from Scotland. At Logie in Stirlingshire, there's a certain well which is believed to be a fairy well, with tales of a wee fella in a fine blue jacket been seen there. And this poem's called Blue Jacket. Travelling the road to Sheriff Muir, you might catch beside the well a flash of, was it blue? Who can tell? Feel a thirst you never knew you had before. And take a step into the dell to fill your hands with water clear, cool and dancing, bring it near to drink beside the... What's that smell? And who's the little fella here? In tailored jacket, blazing blue, and golden buckles on his shoe, and... Grinning, in no way sincere. 
talking business as if he knew you well in single days, before the love and childer came your ways, and on your brow the ridges drew. And can you believe the things he says? The water dribbling from your hand, your tongue as dry as sand, still caught within his craze. Oh, take your drink, you thirsty man, his belly rolling, then he's strolling, calling, will you join the band? As fellas come with colours bowling out from all the open hill with drums and pipers blowing shrill and in no ways consoling. Water in your fingers still, but gone almost and nearly lost, you raise the last and drink your fill. What magic can this water boast? A single drop's now to fill your benny anyhow, but wonder at the cost. The fairy dance upon the brow, the rolling, rollicking, sharp and glad and nearly mad, departing in the glow. The fellow in his jacket clad. And quiet as it was before, you on the road to Sheriff Muir, with a thirst you never knew you had. I wonder if this will work. I don't know if this one will work. We'll see. It's a poem about the knotsman. But it's a poem that wasn't in the book. Because it was only written this year. I say written. It was only found this year. A couple of years after the publication. Who knows whether it would have made it into the collection or not. But you do need to know for this one of Isabel Gaudi, who in the mid-17th century was tried as a witch and confessed. Her confession went something like that she could go into a hair with sorrow and mickle care and she would go in the devil's name. We have her confession and um, this still survives, I don't know whether she was reprieved or executed. But this piece here sees the knotsman in the locale, hearing of a capture and thinking to do something about it. It's found written in a strange dialect, which may be Scots, may be Northern, hard to tell. I'll read it as it's written. Once a knotsman come, and takisen, nay to tune, for all se finders sicken watches, braying of the sum they fund. Tak him to se hair is feldin, his lad and hay, taking up the wads of twixted stulks from where se lay, spindle whirls a stulks nested in se settled farm. All in droppings, twixt a hair and still a wum. Do you mean to set her fray, master? Loose upon the fields and sky again, and bring here from sir hanging bonds or out sir ringing claus of men. La, a men to set her fray, but nay from ringing claus of men. Here's some means to flee the traps, by leg a wing a paw again. But I'll sell sick to loose a hair from a nethier's game. Tis Isabel's, so willing is, never in ne defil's name. Attack that thread from out here spell, here ain. And not Sidefil's name.
If it makes sense to you, do let me know. To England now. There's a tail attached to the, de the Devil's Punch Bowl in Surrey. Near to the town of Thursley, I think. Named for the old English thunder god Thunar, known more to us as Thor. Ever whom's Thursday is named. But there's a grave there of an unknown sailor and a legend attached. And Th Thunder's connection to the punch bowl is a tale of how the devil was taunting him. And Thunder scooped up a huge clod of earth and flung it at the devil. And that's how the punch bowl was made. Combine those two stories into this poem. The title of which is taken as a quote from Turner, the painter who visited there. Hark the creaking irons, hark the screeching owl. I am the unknown sailor, come lately from the sea. By devil's bowl they stripped me bare, and there did murder me. They had no coin to buy them ale, but I a guinea gold, which furnished them with goodly fare, and made them newly bold. They walked with me upon the way, companions in the cold, but all alone they came to town, my coat and vestment sold. And all alone they left me there beside the devil's bowl, which Thor had scooped out of the earth to save his blessed soul. And Thor it was did strike the flare my coat and vestments found did bring the folk of Hindhead to me dead upon the ground. And at the sun in rake my three murderers were took, condemned to die on Hindhead Hill beneath the gibbet's hook. My thanks to folk of Hindhead Town who raised my cross and stone. But more to Thor, whose mighty storm did dash their cursed bones. The Unknown Sailor, Fine Head. Stepping from folklore into myth and legend and this the myth and legend of Wales there is a poet known as Taliesin who in fact is a figure out of history and of legend and of mythology several figures combined and attached to his name The story of his birth is one of rebirth. Keridwin is the goddess of, amongst many things, inspiration. Her son, her unfortunate son, having no luck, she brewed a potion in a cauldron for him to drink to counter it and give him spirit and inspiration and fire. And she set Gwion, or Gwion Bach, to stir the pot and make sure it didn't spoil. But just as the potion was coming to perfection, three drops spat from the cauldron, landed on his thumb and putting it to his mouth. 
all the luck and inspiration that she had planned for her son went to Guyambach. He had to flee, and there followed a chase of animal transformation as he turned into a, a hare, she turned into a greyhound, he turned into um, a bird, she turned into a hawk, um, finally he turned into a grain of corn, she turned into a chicken, scooped him up. She carried him for nine months and then gave birth to him. Beautiful boy. She couldn't kill him. Instead, she cast him into a river, floating down to see what fate would decide. The bag he was in got caught on a weir and there a human, a very unlucky human, up till then, found him, adopted him and named him Taliesin. And that brought him great, great luck. Taliesin means radiant brow, perhaps flaming brow, burning brow, perhaps a, a hint at what's the fire in his brain. This poem, Kawidwin. I brewed this for my ugly son, so he might live, accepted of the court. For three drops of poet's ecstasy have fallen to your tongue, Guillaume Bach, now you must flee. You think a hare will outfly me, I turn you as a greyhound. Now you think to learn the fishes run, I discern you, otter eyes, over you as hawk, little bird, stern and unforgiving, scattered at my stoop you fall amongst the corn amidst a scoop of grains, wishing there to dupe me. Black hen, high crowned, I gather you into my croup. Bach, set to keep the cauldrons boil only for a year. I, for my son, toil, adding herb wort to the moil, chanting incantations fit to make a slave royal. For my lost, unlucky boy, coming home to find three whole drops missing from the foam, the gatekeeper gone to roam, the rest spoilt. Wretched afterbirth spilt across the loam. Carry you now, for the nine months bear you, cannot bear to kill you, beauty saves you, take you to the river's brew, throw you in on a May Eve, see what fate may construe. Guiamba, leather skin carries you now, bag upon the breeze, caught upon a bough across the weir, the court flow, unlucky sun gazing in at the radiant brow. Three drops I grew around them, scalded from the cauldron fallen of Kawidwen, taken from a year of stirring and a day I grew. Swallowed up, they spat upon me, took my thumb, and in her womb I grew around them from the seething lap, Kawidwen's in her croup. Was once a hare, a dove, a grain, at last too lovely to be slain, a coughed thing thrown upon a river, caught upon a weir. Shining on my founder's face, learning tongues to agree with, learning words, luck, landing like three drops, I grew around them. One upon my heart, a flaring one upon my belly, burning one upon an arm, a fire in my vein, a doing thing. Her other son remains unlucky, shadow of my brows shining, and my death she didn't take. Three drops to give back 
to the cauldron. Taliesin. Three left. Two of which come out of Ireland. Talking of poetic inspiration, a figure looked to in Ireland for that is Brigid, Brigid, Bride, canonized as a saint. But before that, the triple faced goddess, the smith, the healer, and the poet. This is one called Three Fires. They told me of three fires burning in the hills, each at the mouth of a darksome cave. And either one of those three fires would my sweet life save. And either one of those three fierce fires would put me in my grave. I thought I lacked the strength to climb the shaggy heights, but still the road was keen and kind, and in my face was the dizzying moon, and at my back the wind. My feet were of my mother's race, and left my slow companions far behind. And came I to the first of those three fires fierce, where to and from the cavern there came such cries upon the air of hurt from fearsome wounds and pain and a woman dressed in bloody hands. She asked of me my name. And came I to another of those fires bright before its cave, from whence there flared such clash of metals as of war and strife. There stood a woman, wild-haired, sweat-stained, and hammer in her hand, and fiercely stared. So came I to the third, and this a fire raged while beside and on a heightened chair a harp upon her lap a woman smiled and around her on the air such music sweet and poetry melodious and fair you did not stay she said my sister by nor go into her bloody cave for that is bride the healer who would your sweet life save or through her ministrations ease you to a gentle grave and my other sister i saw you passing by nor go into her forging cave for that is bride the metalsmith with blades and spears your life to save, or with her gold and trinkets, ornament for you a richer grave. But you have come to me at my darksome door, with harmonies and music from my cave, and I am bride the poet, with melodies sweeter than your life to save. So take the breath of fire, sing, the song shall live, though you take your rest and wander in a silent grave. I attended a ritual to Bride one time, the first time I'd met her. A 
and the leaders of the ritual work to spell, which allowed us each to ask a favour of her. And she granted it. And so that poem just was part of my thanks to her for that. Another tale out of Ireland concerns the warrior Oshin. who was taken into fairy, disappeared from our world. But the tale goes how, centuries later, longing to see Ireland again, he requested permission to go back. Warned, though, not to get off his horse. The story goes that he met St. Patrick there, some versions. Other versions say that his saddle brow, saddle, snapped and he fell to the earth, or that he stepped to the earth himself. And as soon as he did, the centuries he had missed fell upon him and he turned to dust before their eyes. Oshin's Homecoming. I am only now waking from the dream. I think I have been lost. The silver mist at my back, the only song to tell me where I was. The silver of this white horse between my legs, the only touch. Only now do I remember memory, how thoughts can fall as white stones to make a house, a wall, or such as will keep a living safe. There were no stones on the silver side, though here I see silver grey smooth amidst the, yes it is, grass and grace thrown barriers around this fallow land. I am looking for the colour here. I have intimations of fruit and colour, music. I, I think I have been dancing. I thought I was kissed. I have eyes in my eyes, behind my tears, my clouded mind. The horse stands four square, does not bend its neck to taste. The grass, yes, it is grass, will not take another step. Only now do I remember weight. That brings the thought to fall as white stone, to bring a worth to gold. Makes me something this horse must carry. I am looking for the touch of earth, hearing in my ear, do not allow the touch of earth in such a song. Like what the shell has kept of the western ocean, like what the night has kept of the dancing fox. Only now do I remember time allowing thoughts to be said, white stone tumbling in a scree, a white corpse upon the hill, a doorway in a white wall turned to face the sun in the middle time of a year, and all the fairy tribes are leading her here. And here is this man of holiness, walking from the crowd, and now do I remember sound and voices, now do I remember need. He stops by my horse upon the grass, 
Will you not dismount? We have food for you and water. And at the altar rail we have wafer and wine and eternal life. And now I am remembering touch on white stone, soft as feather down, soft as centuries turning, soft as a step onto grass. Oshin's homecoming. Thank you for having a listen, joining me. I've got one more for you. And it returns to that very first poem and that spell for seeing the fairy gazing at the axe as you're covered in sheepskin lying on bull hide a cat beside you in the crossroads, four churches around you. All in order to see the fairy processional at All Hallows. There's an axe, sharp as an atom, planted by its handle in the ground. I am floating thought across the blade, like it's a fairy processional. In fact, I'm floating shame to sliver it, sever it, know it, layer by layer, the fair the foul, the toother, the fearbulk, each in turn into the hills. At a meet of four crosses covered by sheepskin, a cat as companion, we watch the she pass to either side, the glamour divided, the shame that sent the fairest folk out of sight, out of grace, out of my forgiveness. See, nothing was done wrong, only from over nine waves, the new arrivals laughing at our childish ways, like parents knew us naked, gave us clothes to grow out of. Cat, my friend, do you see them? Me, ashamed under sheepish skin for all my axing. Shame is a shadow worn under skin, out of communion. You hear its music sometimes, calling from under the hills. The fairest folk, devils. <laughs>